I have a map in my head, and so do you. It's your way of interpreting and navigating the world around you. In other words, your sense of place. This year, in my cartography class, I asked students to draw maps of the places where they felt the most free or the most able to express themselves. This might be a place where you find you ha consistently have great ideas, a place to shed the concerns of the everyday, a place where you are just you. You might feel free to shout from the top of your lungs or be completely still and consider life's great questions. It might be your home when everyone is out of the house and you feel free to dance around with complete abandon. Speaking, of course, from personal experience, <laughs> you likely have a few of these. Here's what the students came up with. You can see that these are steeped in the natural world. There are rivers, lakes, mountains, and trees. And each one is associated with particular colors, textures, paths, and emotions. And in these spaces, you can create an even deeper sense of place, a richer experience, by leaving that sneaky location tracker behind. I'm talking, of course, about your smartphone. As of last year, 90% of American adults had one. And as of this year, 95% of American teenagers have access to one. And it's your phone that sells you on the best of available experiences, but is in fact so curated to our own data that it limits our potential to discover. Location data are constantly harvested from our phones and then sent back to us in ways that dictate our behavior. Let's say I'm traveling by car to a town I've never been to. I hop on I-70 and immediately hit traffic. My GPS app tells me an alternative route is available and it will save me three minutes. <laughs> yes. I and all the other drivers with the same app cruise on over to the next exit. I get into the traffic there too, but I eventually make it to the town wondering if, if it would have been faster to just sit in the original traffic, but no matter. Once there, I'm starving. So out comes my phone to use my location and consumer ID to return a list of nearby places to eat. Four stars and up, sorted by recommended and a modern aesthetic, and I will take this information and spend the next 15 minutes optimizing, scouring through reviews. <laughs> At this point, despite my valiant efforts, it's not really me making the decision. I'm letting my phone dictate where I'm going to eat when I could have just gotten out of the car, walked into the town, and risked having great or terrible food without the corroboration of the internet. And that's the unsettling thing about relying on the data stream. We tend to only visit locations that appeal to us from our curated list of returned options. Chances are, we're missing out on a wider diversity of experiences that we would otherwise stumble upon and greatly enjoy. We're missing the possibility of serendipitous moments of place. The joys that happen by accident. Of course, it can be a scary thing to leave your phone behind, given our extreme reliance on it. There's even a term for this, nomophobia. The fear of being without your mobile phone or cell service. We're also trained to equate having our phone and our location with a sense of safety. Location sharing with friends and family is common practice. One popular family tracking app purports to have 50 million monthly users, 
or one in nine US families. In an app like this, you can stream your location to a loved one, monitor theirs, or receive alerts when the person you're tracking leaves a certain area. In this framework, we equate a dot on the map with safety or peace of mind. They're only safe if I know where they are. This ignores that the leading causes of death in children are motor vehicle accidents and firearm-related injuries, which tend to happen when kids are where they're supposed to be, that is, at home, at school, or in between. Under the illusion of safety, normalizing tracking exacerbates vulnerability to domestic violence and stalking. Consider that the tracking of a loved one reinforces control of the person doing the observing over the person being observed. Then, when we have knowledge of our own being tracked, it can stifle our sense of self-reliance, independence, and trust in relationships. It also serves to reinforce a fear of spaces considered other, that is, outside the approved zones. In this way, tracking can shrink the radius of places we feel comfortable in and lower our diversity and richness of experience. If we're sticking to approved zones, we're missing out on opportunities to grow and discover. The other catch with apps collecting location is that they often operate as free, but profit greatly from the sale of our personal data. In 2020, that same family tracking app made 20% of its profits by selling timestamp locations of users 13 and older to multiple data brokers, sometimes within just 20 minutes of the initial recording. In fact, this is common practice for apps collecting location. When creating an app, developers will borrow snippets of code from existing ones, like a piece that helps show your dot on the map, a piece that helps you log in via Facebook, or a piece that helps the app work on the Android operating system. These code helpers are called Software Development Kits, or SDKs, and hidden in them are lines that send data from your phone back to the third party. And location, alongside your device ID, is very valuable. That's why it's constantly repackaged, bought, and sold behind the scenes in a behind-the-scenes network that's truly challenging to get a full sense of. If you were to search for where to buy GPS data, you wouldn't have to look far. Companies on data trading websites boast of selling locations for 1.5 billion devices. And when you look at what's included in this, there's a precise set of location coordinates, a timestamp to the second, and a unique user ID. Despite any claims that this is anonymous because there are no names or dates of birth associated with the data, a study from 2013 showed that just four location points over time are enough to uniquely identify 95% of individuals. Purchasers of data from this network now include the FBI, the IRS, and the Department of Homeland Security, who can all access it the same way you can, with money. No need for a warrant. <sighs> That's a lot. And the uncertainty of not really ever being able to be sure where our location data are going or what they're used for, add to the shadowy power of their hold on us. So let's return to that space where we feel free and untethered. Sometimes I think of this space like a journal. You might use a journal to work through emotions, tackle a specific problem, or motivate yourself. It's a part of your personal growth, and it's not for a wide audience. It's private. It's not a set of pages that you would want read by others, possibly misconstrued, 
and then use to make decisions about you. Your location data operate the same way. They're a record of your journey across this Earth. And just like other data, they're subject to error and misinterpretation. Your time in your place of freedom may already be a data point, analyzed and out for sale as a point of interest. You may think that there is nothing to hide in your location data, but maybe there's something to lose. So the next time you get the opportunity to visit the places where you feel the most free, the most alive, and the most you, try leaving the tracker behind and be fully there in your sense of place. I have a map in my head, and now you get to make your own. Thank you.